I'm a student of the Bible, and I have studied the Bible a little. And in my study of the Bible, I found out that prayer is who we are and not what we do. And because it is who we are, I wanted to find out the essentials of sustaining or building a life of prayer. Essentials. Our emphasis this time is not prayer as a ministry for the church, but prayer in the lives of individuals. Because we have a problem. And the problem is that the average believer does not understand what prayer is. So we are hoping that through the course of this conference, the Lord will bring education and encounters that will ins install us on the motherboard of spiritual experiences through prayer. Are you still with me? So we are looking at the essentials of prayer. I will show you, there are seven of them, but we'll, I will show you two of them. You study five yourself. Hebrews chapter five, beginning from verse number seven. You join me in the next 10 minutes with strings. Look for the strings now, look for it. Because we are going on a journey. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7. This is one of the snapshots in the scriptures that reveal the practice of Jesus' prayer life. There are a few snapshots in the Bible, and we are going to consult with each snapshot so that we'll see, we'll have an idea of how the Lord himself engaged in the act of prayer. Okay, in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7, the Bible says, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him who was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared. He was not heard because he made effort. He was heard because the prayer was also carried in his soul. He feared. Now, if you check this snapshot, you realize that prayer is supposed to be an activity that captures the powers of your entire being. The issue with many prayer warriors is that they do not know how to give themselves. You know, are you still with me? This man was caught up in this experience. His soul was there. His emotion was there. The Bible says he was caught up with strong tears. And there is a sense of his helplessness that is pictured in this scripture. A helplessness because the Bible says that he was praying unto him that was able to save what? Him from death. The one he was praying to seem to have an ability. Are you there? The one he was conferring with seems to have an ability. And he wanted him to exercise that his ability on his behalf. And that was the reason why his prayer was achieved with strong crying, with tears and with fear. 
His entire being was taken up in this adventure. So the first limitation I find in the prayer experience of the average believer is his inability to give himself. I know you pray for long, and that's good. And we are going to talk about persistent prayer. The prayer of knocking at the door. Because some of you cannot knock beyond three days. And there are some things that were born and formed from a womb that, that sustained the protocol for 28 months of gestation period. In order for there to be equilibrium, you will need to know how to knock for 28 months. To turn the tide of that situation that passed through the gestation period of 28 months. So there's a knocking dimension. There's a persistent dimension. We have not gotten there yet because when we get there, we will now need to read the meter of your prayer life and find out the extent of your staying power. Most of us don't stay long enough to get results. So, but that's not where I am. This first point is the ability to give your entire members to the engine called prayer, the protocol of prayer, the spirit of prayer. Because we could see from the scripture that Jesus was totally engaged. His emotion was there. There was a sense of inadequacy that propelled him. There was a consciousness of insufficiency that propelled him. There was a motivation in this equation. The motivation was a quiet fear. A quiet fear of the understanding of how helpless the situation was going to be if God does not respond. And because he did not want that his fear to come to pass, it was sufficient motivation to keep him in the process. His mind was in it. His spirit was in it. His soul was in it. His emotion was in it. And the Bible says that he cried with strong tears. This was not a man that was trying to ensure that the alignment of his lipstick was not affected by the adventure. He lost his decorum. I know most of you, you look for very articulate words in the archives of your mind. And you say, oh God, our King, omnipotent, luminous one in the galaxies of eternity. You are not praying. You are in limbo. <laughs> Everything was in it. You know, as a married man, if me and my wife, if me and my wife have a, a misunderstanding, and I come and hold her hand like this. I know that is not the I'm only holding 30% of the hand. There's <laughs> she has not given me 60%. The average believer doesn't know how to give himself to the spirit of prayer. There is a personality that walks prayer from your human spirit because you do not have the energy to communicate enough for it to make an impression in the courts of heaven. So the prayer protocol, the prayer process is driven by the spirit of prayer. But you see, it's what you give the spirit of prayer that he walks with. If all you give the spirit of prayer is your physical body, 
then the spirit of prayer will only be able to energize your physical body. If what you give to is your mind, then that's the tool that the spirit of prayer has to orchestrate its ministry of bringing your voice before the throne of grace. In the scripture we read in the book of Hebrews chapter 5 verse 7, Jesus' body, Jesus' spirit, Jesus' soul was fully immersed in the act of prayer. Are you still with me? I don't know. There's an example I want to give, but it's not a church example. That's the problem. My first lesson is to teach us how to give your soul. How do you give your spirit? How do you allow yourself to be overtaken by the spirit of prayer? Because for many of us in this room, you have never experienced that intercourse with God where God sweeps you off and you are no longer in charge. And then he, he releases you from detention three hours later. Many of us here have never experienced that. Not because you are not powerful enough. I've heard of your stories. But the problem is, you don't know how to give yourself to the spirit of prayer. Are you here? Prayer contains the total man. I had to go reading the hymns of the 18th century. Because in the hymns of the 18th century, I found testimonies in some of the hymnals that revealed great lives of devotion in the saints that wrote these hymns. So I got one. This is what the saint wrote in his hymn. He said, it is not enough to bend the knee and the words of prayer say, the heart must with the lips agree or else we do not pray. There must be that point where your heart and your mouth meet in agreement because it is possible for your heart to be saying something and your mouth to be saying something else. You see, this creature we call man is a complex entity has diverse parts that may seek to re resonate on different frequencies. But being able to collocate the parts of this entity called man and to submit such parts to the spirit of prayer so that it can work out the protocol of bringing you before the presence of God. If you pray this kind of prayer, you will feel God's response on every part you make available to God. You will feel it on your spirit. You will feel it on your physical body. And you will feel it in your soul. How do you give yourself? The way to give yourself to prayer is to make what is on God's heart your goal. The moment your motivation for prayer is something that is self-centered, the river of prayer is not likely to overflow you. The moment what brought you to the prayer room is not in direct sync with what is on the heart of God, you have lost the opportunity to be overwhelmed by the spirit of prayer. 
I know that there are legitimate needs in your life and you want to talk to God about those needs. There's nothing wrong with that. But the reason why you're an intercessor is not to pray your prayers, but to pray God's prayers. So there's, there's a time for you to pray your prayers. But the reason why you pray every day is not to pray your prayers. The reason why you pray every day must be to pray God's prayer. And when, you, when your desire in your prayer adventure is to know what is on the heart of God, then the protocol of spiritual intercourse begins because God begins to share his heart with you. And for every strand of disclosure that God makes, he sucks you into he, himself. Until there is no loose end left. You might find yourself crying and your, your prayers are not in words that an onlooker can pick and know what you are praying about. That's the kind of prayer that Anna was praying and even the priest himself could not adequately judge the spiritual transaction that was taking place because it was intercourse. She felt it in her spirit. She felt it in her soul. And she mirrored it in her body. She forgot herself. And the man looked at the woman and took her for drunk. Are you still with me? So if I wake up in the morning, the reason why I woke up that morning is not because I'm smart. I woke up in the morning because God decided to show me mercy. So my day must begin with finding out why am I here? Why am I here today? Why did I survive? Many of us trivialize waking up. But the reason why you woke up is not because of any business you are doing or the job you want to seek. God gave you breath because he is hopeful that he will find pleasure from your life that day. He is hopeful that he will be pleased through your life that day. So this is what we do. We don't care about what God wants, what is troubling God. We just show up and say, you know what? I have a job interview. Can you make power available? Manipulate all the people on the panel. Make them accept me. And when you do that, close, you can go on vacation. It's too self-centered to attract the attention of God. Meanwhile, in your world, what you are asking for is legitimate. Yes, keep that one aside first. Find out, why am I here? He may shock you that morning with a disclosure that will make you lose utterance to even present the matter you brought. And while you get consumed in his matter, he will attend to your own matter. The average believer is not concerned about what bothers God. He's not concerned about why God made him wake up from his sleep. The average minister of the gospel is not concerned about what God is doing. He already has his outline of what he wants to achieve. Such a minister will never collide with the glory of God. Meanwhile, God will not kill him. God will be giving him a little grace so that he can get by. Because at, at the end of the day, the gospel is preached. But God does not expect any big thing to come out of his life. Because he doesn't know God's heart. A skillful prayer person that knows that his life depends on prayer begins by attempting to know why. Why did I wake up today? These days when I pray to go preach for meetings, 
I have realized that God may not be sending me to the whole congregation. He's sending me to one individual in the congregation. And I want to know how to identify that individual. When I started thinking that way, he gives me signs on how to locate that one. 10,000 people. Before I finish, I will find, I will find the best. When I... Are you there? <laughs> Meanwhile, the preacher that preaches a good message and everybody is charged up, he's trying. The one that knows what God wants to do, he's not trying. It is God that is using him. He's not working for God. God is using him. He's working with God. Because he, he labored to find out what God wanted to do and then he made himself available to be a vessel. So God was under obligation to reveal to him what he will not reveal to someone that doesn't care about what God wants to do. So the way that man operates, you will see that God is the one walking through him. He's not just anointed. No. What he's doing is not his thing. What he's doing is what God is doing. He's walking with God. The economy of grace that will be on that man's life will be different from the economy of grace that is on the life of someone that just wants to have a good meeting, a good service. He wants to have a message so that it will not be said that on Sunday morning there was nothing to preach. Your first point of call in giving yourself in your prayer processes is desiring to know what is on the heart of God. Do you know that when you begin to ask God, what is troubling you? He will not believe that you are serious for a long time. He will not respond. And you keep asking him, that's why I came. I don't have any other prayer point. It's just to find out about you. How are you doing? Are you okay? Is there any problem? Then he will take you to a place, a secret place. A place where normal people are not found. Then he will show you one thing. That thing he will show you with glue on your heart. It will become a body. It is standing on your heart by spiritual power, by spiritual means. When God, in response to the fact that you want to know what is upon his heart, puts a burden upon you, that burden becomes the license that affords God the opportunity to draw you and to suck you into his realm anytime you stand before him. With your intention to know God, it's not enough to know God. No one can know God if God doesn't want you to know him. No. But when God sees that there's a genuine hunger on your heart, not for the things of man, but the things of God, then he will bring you to where he reveals the things of God. It's a chamber in his spirit. Are you there? Or you are not there? Just one burden on your heart can take you for 25 years. Will be enough reason for you to pray in a way that normal people don't pray. Because with the body, it's a commensurate supply of spiritual energy to keep you steadfast in prosecuting that need that is upon the heart of God and giving God the opportunity to begin to fulfill it. So I've decided not to stay in the outer court. So for many years, I was asking God, what is on your heart? What is troubling you now? That was when the Lord told me that falsehood will reach a peak in your lifetime. And because you have asked me, I will recruit you to be one of the foot soldiers that we use against the spirit of deception. Are you there? 
From the day the Lord said that to me, he removed me from the general pool of ministers and brought me to a place where he shows me the deception that Satan is about to hash. And when you see how vicious it is and how many people it will influence, nobody will ask you to pray. The burden will become your invitation into that place where prayers are made. Are you there? If you have not entered into this exclusive group, your prayer life and your Christian life will look like the average Christian life in your generation. The moment you come into this exclusive group, you will be like a standalone entity. Your body is different. Your style is different. Your emphasis is different. Even though people may not like you, you even receive energy from their hatred. Because what is driving you is not on social media. If God raises you as a warrior, he gives, he, he, he equips you with an armor. An armor that is effective in the kind of fight he has called you to fight. Are you with me? So find what is on the heart of God. That's the entry point into receiving a body. And it is a body that makes you give yourself. So when you see a believer praying without a body, he's very conscious of himself. His mind is in his pocket. He's counting all the money in the pocket. Meanwhile, he's praying in tongues. And he prays for long. But his mind is not in what he's doing. He doesn't have a body. He's been, he, he's around prayer people. So he has learned how to pray. So he knows how to pray. So he can pray for some time. He has found that grace so he can sustain the prayer. But he does most of what he does absent-minded because he doesn't have a body. His lack of a body is suggestive of the fact that he has not entered into the exclusive group because he has not sought to find out what is on the heart. Of God. That's number one. Number two. Let me do one scripture in the book of Luke chapter 22. Luke 22 verse 40 to 44. And when he was at the place, he said unto them, pray that he entered not into temptation and he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast and kneeled, kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me nevertheless. Not my will, but thine be done. Yes? And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. I'm just showing you some of the structures God puts in place. Sometimes the strength of your own recreated human spirit is not strong enough for you to go the length where you can get help. The guy has the right body. He has the right prayer point. The will of God is in front of his adventure, but he doesn't have the capacity to arrive at a place where he will be considered serious. And God himself now arranges a generator to boost his capacity. If, if there was an alternative to prayer, we would have seen it here. You are traveling from Makodi to Abuja and your fuel finishes in Lafia. Go to a filling station. So this filling station method. The spiritual energy was not sufficient. So God had to create 
Are you there? I don't know how many of you have experienced this. Angelic strength in prayer. If you ever experience this, your sense of time will be lost. It's like detention. You are detained. You will not be conscious of time. That's what I'm saying. If you are conscious of time, no. It's your strength. The one in your spirit. If this happens to you, you will lose all sense of time. It's like detention. It's only when that angel leaves you that you will recover yourself from the process. It means that God wants to do it and he wants to do it through your spirit man so he sends help to boost your spirit capacity so that you can arrive at the terminus. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly. Can you see that there is the, the turbo charger? The moment the angel came and began to strengthen him, there was a turbo charger effect. He prayed more earnestly and his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling to the ground. I know most of us have tried to arrive at this point. You, you can't... <laughs> this reality is a turbocharged reality that is occasioned by external help to boost the output of your spirit in the journeys of prayer. Can you take a snapshot of that? Because this is the snapshot I would like you to go home with. And being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly and his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling to the ground. Can you see that every aspect of him was in this prayer? Prayer requires the total man. Please help me preach to your neighbor. Prayer requires the total man. I have experienced this before. I came from work in Kano. I normally go to the mountain to pray. So I was late. Removed my tie, dropped my bag to run to the mountain. Then I was obstructed by an angel. I was in that detention. I came back by 4 p.m. I was in that detention to 3 a.m. in the morning. It was not my human spirit that was at work. That was where I passed into the context of my calling, the context of my ordination, the context of the anointing that has the errand from heaven to fulfill, to give me the capacity to fulfill what God has called me to do. It's, it's possible for you to have a calling. I never walk in the anointing that empowers you to fulfill that calling. 3 a.m. in the morning, I was, I was released from the detention. I came the next day again to go to the mountain top, and I was accosted by those angels, four of them. When they left, my physical body was not tired. So I was not using my physical strength. It was spiritual strength. And I was standing before God. Sometimes I stand before him like that in eight, for eight hours. I'm not talking about praying. I'm saying standing before God. He was in agony. There was a turbo church dimension. And some physical things that don't normally happen began to happen. Prayer takes the whole man. This night when you want to pray, try it. Ask God, saturate me. Take me over. Pray that for 30 minutes before you start. Saturate me. Take me over. Saturate me. Take me over. Consume me. 
pray that prayer. You will have an experience that you may not have had all your life. So prayer takes the whole man, requires the whole man, desires the whole man. Are you there? Number two. Prayer is devotional. And I need to read this to us quickly. Devotion is a frame of indebtedness found in one that is entirely submitted to God. Devotion dwells in the realm of quietness. Devotion is still before God. Devotion is serious, thoughtful, and meditative. Devotion belongs to the inner life, the attitude of the inner life, the configuration of a heart that is in desperate surrender. Devotion is what exposes you to the realities of what the Bible calls the secret place. Because the desire in devotion is to cultivate a relationship. You are cultivating a relationship. And anyone that knows about relationship knows that every move must be deliberate. Every move must be intentional. Every move must be an investment that is delicately built in with the hope of securing the trust in a relationship. I saw a man, how he treated his dog for four years. He became so friendly with the dog and the dog became so friendly with him. That was what he got from his devotion. So if you, the scripture says, if we draw near to God, God will draw near to us. So that attitude of intentionally drawing near to God, with the hope that you will not have a relationship with him. With the hope that one day, he too will draw near to you and a relationship will begin. That's the heart of devotion. It is quiet. It is intelligent. It is deliberate. It seeks relationship. So in prayer, we give our all. There's an aspect, and I'm talking about the I'm not talking about prayer. I'm talking about the essentials, what you need. We have not entered the subject of prayer itself. What we are looking at are the essentials. If, if we are saying that we are going to function in prayer, there are several things that are very critical that you cannot ignore. The average Christian knows how to pray in tongues, but he doesn't know how to be sober within to hear God. There's a quietness. How I wish I have words to explain what I'm talking about. Because when God begins to advance be to your spirit man, your heart will be able to understand the language of God. The Bible reveals in the book of John chapter 4 verse 24 that God is spirit and that they that worship him will have to worship him in spirit and in truth. It is your spirit that God who is spirit can contact. It's your spirit that God who is spirit can touch. 
Are you there? This devotional life that is an essential in prayer is an attempt to be able to glean from God's presence when he makes an attempt to contact your spirit. That attitude is already there to be able to understand his language when he shows up. Many of us know how to fly but we don't know how to catch prey. We don't know how to receive the word of the Lord in our spirit. man. That's where the masters are separated from the young men. It's in the matter of maintaining a soberness within that can interact with the spirit of God. So there's a devotional aspect. And the question I have for you today is, how well have you trained your heart to design the movements of God? This devotional aspect, your capacity to understand the language of God's movements. Because when God begins to move, he's talking. But your heart may not even sense that God is moving. Your heart may not even sense, may not even discern what God is saying by the movements that he sustains within your spirit man. It is that conscious and that deliberate attitude of devotion that will give you the ability to understand the language by which the spirit of God communicates. 